Okay. Okay. So, uh, welcome to the second seminar that we are holding on this philosophy of the literary. And um, I mean, if you are following up from my previous lecture, well, all the all the seminars that we are doing uh, in a series, which I envisage to do around seven to eight with you all, will be about a very different subject. And uh, I'll try to bring in lots of things because uh, this is exactly the way I want to do seminars this is exactly the way i do my writing and my and and, and all my critical interests are primarily very transdisciplinary so that uh, is something that uh, i would like to introduce in the seminars as well now in 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 the first in the first talk we spoke about uh, different kinds of concepts that bring about the literary literary not in the sense of literature literary in the sense of building a kind of imaginary building a kind of and, and you can call it an ideational, ideational construct. Well, that could be that could be something that is revisionary. That could be a kind of a kind of a principle that works on revenge aesthetics. But today's uh, uh, discussion that we I, I hope to keep it within sixty to seventy minutes today. It would it would focus on the idea of the totality. Now, uh, once we once we start to speak of totality. Um, once that kind of a thing comes up, then uh, the first thing that we talk about is what that the totality as a kind of a concept, it, it, it comes primarily with very importantly with for Western thinkers. Um, if anyone talks about totality or the tradition of totality, then you're primarily thinking about for Western thinkers and, 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 and much labored, much walked out. So I don't think I will be going into that because if we go into discussing those four thinkers, then obviously, I um, mean, that would just be a very elucidatory, explanatory way of doing a seminar. But my seminars are something that I will force you to think. My seminars are something that I will give you the lead. You can go and do your stuff, do your work, but you come back to think a little differently, moving across different disciplines, moving across certain discourses. So the first, the, the first thing is that when we are talking about this idea of totality, then obviously we think about Karl Marx because Marx is where the whole totalization and totality is something that becomes very important. From, from of course, uh, uh, to, to go back a little, I mean, we can talk about the totality that the way Kant looked at it and how Kant's totality is being superseded or rather given a different interpretation by Hegel. And from Hegel, then you come down to Karl Marx and uh, then obviously from Karl Marx, uh, uh, we get to Theodor Adorno, whose ideas about totality are very important in his understanding. And then of course, heavily influenced by French theory, you have Frederick Jameson to talk about totality. So these are the, the, the tradition that you're looking at, the Western tradition, primarily the people who have spoken a lot about totality. I would say that if you put it this way, then it would actually come with Hegel, then Marx, and then you come with Adorno, and then you come with Frederick Jameson. Um, it's an interesting concept because, you know, if you, if you were looking at totality, let me put it very, very simplistically, even not simple, I would say very simplistically to you all. When, when you talk about totality, you know, you are actually talking about bringing something together under the sign of totalitarianism. So under the sign of totalitarianism, is it a kind of an imperative that you try to bring certain ideas, certain thoughts, certain structures in? Now, the imperative is something that it can, it can obviously be a kind of a categorical imperative. It can be a very demonstrative imperative. It can also be something like you can call it as a very constative imperative that you start to put on a certain structure of a thought. So you bring it within a certain format, a certain structure. But um, uh, this has been a problem with many thinkers. I mean, if you go back, even, even if you look at the postmodern times, then you see the way Bruno Latour tries to redo this idea of totality. And also you see how uh, Lyotard, almost screaming back at this whole concept of totality to say, but let us wage a war on totality. So, you know, these are um, the little things that uh, we will come to later. And if you do find time, although I do have a very different way of discussing totality with you today. Um, 
what exactly do we do now is that we start to see what these people are doing. I mean, these people that I mentioned uh, uh, just at the beginning. Now, totality is, 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 is seen not as an object, but it's, it's seen as a kind of a method. And, um, and, and, and also it is, it is primarily not seen as a kind of an ontological positivity. Probably it's, it's not awaiting a representation in literary content. So the ontological positivity is not something that's been looked at. So it is basically seen as an orientation. It's seen as an orientation in thinking and um, an orientation that probably can guide us both with theory and literature. So. Even we see that later, I mean, if the way we build our novelistic thinking, the way we think about novels, totality also becomes a paradigm. A totality also becomes a kind of a driving motor that goes into your understanding of the novel as well. Even, even, even areas of globalizing the novel, or globing the novel, so to say. Or you can say the rise of the novel. That is also something that totality is incremental in. But, um, um, Totality, you know, it's also something that can be very in general. It can be seen as something that is without art and uh, uh, without without radically imposed contours or without mediation. That's the way the Anna Harlow looks at it. And also, it is it is it is interesting to see that um, beyond the generality of of uh, art performative production. If you look at the beyond the gender of an intensive whole, when all kinds of art they start to enjoy a kind of a kind of transitivity, a sort of a sort of movement that keeps on challenging the whole framework or the pressure that totality puts on a certain kind of structure. So um, if one goes back, uh, say, to the Greek and the Greek way of looking at theory, and uh, theory as being seen as something like uh, seeing an object or speculating an object, then obviously um, we start to think that um, Kant, when he's talking about the origin of theories and origin of theories distinct departure from philosophy, we know that there are certain categories, there are certain reflexes, and, uh, and, and it's very difficult for us to overcome the, the split that exists between the subject and the object. Say, say the split that exists between the thing and its appearances. It's very difficult to overcome that. And uh, that's the reason why, you know, um, uh, what is, what is uh, very important for Kant is to see that what is empirically sensible and at the same time, what is actually intellectually you can conceptualize. So it is important that Kant's critical system, I mean, if you're, even if you're looking at, um, say, uh, of things that Kant provides that is, is, is providing a total account of the world, but is also providing an account of the haters that extend or the gap that that, that exists between the subject and the object or the thing and the appearance or the, 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 the empirically sensible and the intellectually con conceptualizable. I mean, that's where something that exists and something that you want to conceive. There is always a kind of a gap between the two. Now, this is what the problem of totality does because once once this kind of a thing starts to come in uh, you see the way hegel he shifts this from the opposition he brings in two elements for that matter say a and b and he knows that there is a cleavage that that exists between a and b and of course the cleavage that exists between the knower and the knowing and there is always that speculative gap that exists between what you call the, the understanding of subject and with the understood object. So there is somewhere that sort of a split or a gap that exists. Now, uh, does this stay very, very undigested in Hegel? Because, because Hegel is all the time trying to build up a kind of a, a kind of a, a, a bring together of consciousness. That is one consciousness starts to supersede the other and move on to another level of consciousness. And there is always the tendency to reach at a point where this totality can be brought out. Now, um, can this harmony, can this harmony between, as I said, the knowing subject and the, and, the, and, the, and the desiring object, can there be a sort of a harmony that you start to build difficult? The harmony is very difficult to build. And there comes the, the contradiction 
and the contradiction actually comes up between the connection that you one can build as well as the disconnection that uh, one also tries to build but um uh, uh, the theorist you know he, he, whoever knows this sort of contradiction he is all the time looking at propelling a kind of a new synthesis he's trying to bring in new negations new synthesis to come in so that the theorist starts to feel that there is an orientation in the way he sees because as i said theory is about knowing theory is about seeing so there is a, a there is a particular tendency among the theorists to really see that one is orienting towards a totality or not, or probably um, uh, trying to trying to understand this totalizing arc of reason uh, within which one tries to understand certain things. So um, that kind of a totality is towards where Hegel uh, tries to lead us to. And uh, uh, this is something where I say that Kant always talks about the split. Hegel is trying to really overcome the split. But is it a successful overcoming? Probably not. That is where the whole concept of the totality as contradiction starts to exist. Now, um, uh, if one goes into the understanding of uh, the method of totality for Karl Marx, then uh, the totality is uh, uh, the contradiction that is not existing in the mind. It's not existing inside the mind of the philosopher theorist, but the contradiction starts to exist in the everyday relationship. That is where Marx takes it to. If Hegel is taking it to, for Kant, it's the mind, for Hegel, it's the consciousness, and for Marx, it's neither of the two. It's, it's, it's neither, neither uh, uh, the mind nor the consciousness, but it is where he's taking it to the everyday relationships that exist in life. And uh, uh, these are the relationships that start to determine that mind. So it is from the outer world that your inner world starts to get constructed. So what happens then? So it is not a question of the reality of the consciousness. It's not a question of the reality of the mind, but it becomes a question of the historical reality. And this historical reality becomes the field of contradiction. And where you have the tension that starts to build about the theorist, it's, it's whether the, what the theorist knows about knowing, at the same time, what they know about the historical effects and social consequences of that knowing. So how much do they know? What are they trying to know? And what are the consequences and offshoots and fallouts of those historical effects in social consciousness that comes out of its understanding? So Marx actually proposes not only um, theory that it must account for the material conditions for like, uh, it's it just not thinking anymore. It's like eating, it's like drinking, it's like dwelling, it's like thriving, which all takes, takes shape and takes place. And at the same time, it also accounts for the way you are describing the world, or you, your destinations of knowledge are determined, where you are all the time trying to rationalize and destabilize those, those particular social contexts within which this theory operates. So Marx has this uh, mode of doing it, and uh, I will not stay on with Marx too long because, um, of course, it gets to a whole session that you want to do with Marx. But that is not the point here. Marx is something that we might pick up later because, you know, he is somebody who has uh, uh, this, this very interesting dialectic and this primarily from his historical reality or historical materialist reality. He's trying to develop this sort of an idea of the, the contradiction that builds from a social understanding, from the, the, the political economic understanding of things and how that starts to affect the way we start to think about totality as a structure or totality as a method, uh, 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 primarily, if not as orientation, but primarily as a method that Marx tries to look at. But then finally, if we are coming to Frederick Jameson, I'm just I'm just a little rushing through because these are the these are the very well known figures on on totality, and uh, this seminar is is not to explicate Marx's uh, idea of totality or Hegel's idea of totality that would or that would, or uh, or the or Frederick Jameson's idea of dialecticism. We it's something that is not we are interested in because that will take a whole seminar to do it. What I'm very interested in to uh, and get you all, whoever is listening to me today, to get you all into thinking that what can, you can do with totality, the different kinds of things that I'm telling you, which is why I'm just about pitching into the thoughts of Marx or Hegel or Kant and then of Frederick Jameson, and then I move on to a completely different territory. 
so that you start to think very differently. Because you know there is a and there is a kind of um, I would say a uh, 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 very colored supremacy of thinking. Now I don't know whether this colored supremacy is the kind of word that I should be using, but I say colored in the sense that there is a sort of a white supremacy, black supremacy, brown supremacy of thinking, and that is where the problem is. So you know we we we, we are somehow tilted or slanted on the white, and we think that there's, there's there's not much that the brown can really provide. But I will very soon come to the, the, probably the, the biggest philosopher of all time, and his name is Buddha. And Lord Buddha of the Tagata is probably the biggest philosopher of all time, and I'm, and I'm not sure whether we can really categorize him as a white or a brown or a black philosopher. I'll come to that. But before that, I'm just trying to trying to take you along those trodden pathways, and then I will try to get you to those untrodden ones so that it gets a little it gets a little contradictions as well as dialectical when you start to think about it. So that is how the totality as a kind of a formation, totality as a kind of a concept, or totality as a kind of an orientation starts to build. So I will get you, get you there very, very soon. But what does Jameson do is that Jameson is, um, uh, frankly, he, he is influenced by French continental theory, French theory is very much. At the same time, of course, you people know his book on consciousness, his book on Marx, and he is understanding of late capitalism. But all, all done, all said and done, what you can, what, what probably happens here is that um, the, 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 the object is tricky for, for, for Jameson, where he says that totality is not available for representation any more than it is accessible in the form of an ultimate truth. And it is instead the properly unrepresentable ensemble of society's structures as a whole. So I'm quoting Jameson here, so I will repeat this. He'll say, totality is not available for representation any more than it is accessible in the form of an ultimate truth. So it, 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 is, not, it, is, it is not available for representation any more than it is accessible in the form of some ultimate truth. But it is instead the properly unrepresentable ensemble of society structures as a whole. So there are a lot many things that really harkens back into this, this, this Hegelian importance of contradiction. And, uh, and Jameson transfigures this, this any notion of totality as object into totality as contradiction. Totality as object into totality as contradictions, while actually um, activating totality as a method without forgetting that we are actually trying to map the contradictions. That's what we are trying to do. So Jameson has this uh, uh, to say about this contradiction, mapping the contradiction, and at the same time, talking about the unrepresentability of totality as well. So he, he, he also talks about it. So even if you, so, so if you're looking up for these four people here, the four people that I mentioned, the four important thinkers on totality from the other side of the continent, uh, they are all talking about different ways of trying to grapple with this whole problem of totality, whether through historical maturity, uh, uh, whether it's through this, this, the contradictory contradiction and the philosophy of consciousness, or it, it could be the whole understanding of transcendental analytic, or it is also about a Jamesonian way of looking at the unrepresentable, the probably the invisible factor also is so important in, in Jameson as one looks into his cultural logic later, or valences of dialecticism about which he talks later. Now, um, this is something that you people can pick up. Is there, there is a uh, lot of material available and a uh, lot of material available in the open, which you can consult and read and try to see how these people have um, introduced this idea of totality into their writing. I did not mention a donor today because uh, we are a little short on time. We have, I'd like to finish it within 60 to 70, maximum 75 minutes, because that is probably uh, a comfortable time to, to 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 deal with a research seminar. More than that, really a bit tiring. So maybe a dono is something that I'm going to pick up later because um, I, I I would like to engage with a dono in a different way with you all. Primarily, his uh, idea of the non-identical identity. So that's the kind of thing I will pick up later. But 
Coming back to this um, great philosopher, the Buddha. Now we spoke about totality, different kinds of totality about these four people. But, but the question that comes with Buddha are very interesting questions. Now, I'll tell you a story here and uh, uh, an excerpt and uh, try to figure out what this man is trying to do. A caravan was slowly making its way through a Tibetan desert under a scorching sun. Among the travelers was an American who under the pressure of extreme heat and thirst exclaimed, oh, what I wouldn't I give to have a big glass of ice cream soda right now. A Tibetan nearby heard this remark and asked the American, what is this ice cream soda you want so much? Ice cream soda is a wonderful, delicious cold drink. Does it taste like butter tea when it is cold? No, it's not like that. Does it taste like cold milk? No, not exactly an ice cream soda tastes quite different from plain and cold milk. It can have a great variety of flavors. Also, it bubbles up. Then if it bubbles up, does it taste like a burly beer? No, of course not. What is it made of? It is made of milk, cream, eggs, sugar, flavors, ice, and soda water. Puzzled Tibetans still couldn't understand how such a grotesque mixture could be a good drink. Now, this communication becomes an extremely difficult ground, if you call it the common ground of shared experience. What happens now? This example that I gave you about this drink and the Tibetan not being able to understand what is the soda, this particular example gives you the idea that whenever we are trying to interact with an idea, we are interacting with an experience, but interacting with a paradigm. The first thing is the difficulty of trying to find shared experiences of agreement. So the interesting thing is, as you will see, there's a lot of interrogation mark. What is this? How can it be possible? What is it made of? So there are a lot of interrogations that are being put up. Interrogation is probably the first ontological understanding of how contradiction works when one tries to engage with any kind of idea. And Buddha, he is he 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 foresaw all these difficulties. Buddha at the same time he, he was trying to explain his experience to his audience. Now what is the problem? The problem is that Buddha when he achieved the enlightenment then he became a teacher. And once you become a teacher, you have disciples who are going to follow you. Now, if those disciples are following you or trying to learn from you, then it means that you have to share your experiences with them. Think about the Tibetan monk. So he's trying to think about those experiences, the experiences that he himself went through with others. Now, how does he share? Can he share in a direct methodological way? Or is it that? Sharing of that experience also is written or riddled by contradictions. Now, interestingly, if I can really share all my experiences with you, that's the totality. Now, when I'm trying to share my totality with you, then the first thing that comes up, interrogations. And interrogations are the signatures of contradiction. So interrogations are the signatures of the unconceptual. It is about the unrepresentable. It is about the indeterminable. It is about the indescribable. Now that is also very much a part when you're trying to share the totality of your experience, say for Buddha, the enlightenment experience that he wants to share with his disciples, which he cannot. So the problem is that whenever we have a totality, we feel we have understood what the other wants to share. So if A wants to share something with B, then A has to actually share the totality of his experience with B to be able to understand, or rather to be able to be in a place where both can share and understand each other. But is understanding about sharing totality or is understanding about being in the totality, keeping the contradictions alive? That's the question. 
that Buddhism raises. Now, I, I, I said that we can go back to these thinkers to discuss a lot of things, but I chose to do this with a little bit of Buddha here and primarily with, uh, primarily with Mahayana Buddhism to see whether I can really bring this little bit of a transdisciplinary discourse into your understanding of totality. So um, this is one part. Now, coming to what Buddha is doing is that in this Mahayana Buddhism, Buddha is talking about Buddhahood. Now, this is the Buddhahood that one talks about. And when the Buddhahood is being talked about, then it is being summed up with two words. One is totality. Yeah, it is mentioned there in the text. Totality and the other is non-obstruction. So totality and non-obstruction means free flow. So there is no obstruction there. Now, what does this actually mean? You mean that there is a totality that's the other end of non-obstruction? Or do you think both these categories are impossible categories? Yet they are categories. There are lots of categories with which we deal, which we know that they are impossible. But, you know, we always get tempted in a derided way to use the im within a parenthesis and keep the possible out. So that we all the time think that a possibility is always there in an impossibility to actually become or actually turn into the possible. So the impossible has a possibility in it to become the possible. So is that what we are trying to do? Or is it the faith that we start to have about communicating totality? Is it the faith that we have to create a kind of a non-obstruction in our communication? Is it really possible? Now, this is a very interesting thing that, uh, interesting thing that comes up from here is the question of the indescribable. And uh, indescribable is a, a, a very interesting thing as I quote from the Dharma Sutra and probably the, 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 the Dharma Sutra where I'm going to quote things from there. Here is a few quotes that might be very interesting for you all to think about, but how this indescribable comes in. Now, indescribable, there are, they have wonders, they are wonders, but they have names. Indescribable, they have glories, but they have beauty as well. The indescribable are the various dharmas, indescribable are the manners in which they ripen sentient beings. Now, please note that he's saying indescribable, but he's talking about the consequences in a materialized way. I repeat here for you, try to follow what I'm saying. Indescribable are the manners in which they ripen sentient beings. So if you ripen sentient being, that's a concrete consequence that you are drawing. But where is it coming from, the describable or the indescribable? It's from the indescribable. So try to see that there is all the time a kind of a faith in the, in the possibility of the impossible turning into a possible. That's the point he is trying to make. See here, the manners with which they observe, purify, and educate sentient beings are indescribable. The teachings they preach are indescribable. Each of them ripen sentient beings in indescribable manners. Indescribable are their languages, miracles, revelations, and kalpas. Now, but a bodhisattva, now comes the part, but a bodhisattva can clearly explain them all, the indescribable infinite lines all assemble in a hair step of Buddha, neither crowded nor pressing, nor does this hair even slightly expand. In the hair, now this is important, his hair doesn't expand. Everything gets into his hair and stays in the hair. It doesn't expand. So if you say that if I, this is a totality, then I put how many things that there? You say there are five things there. Now I say I put 50 more. So the totality should increase. But totality doesn't increase. Totality is a kind of a state which you're trying to share. For instance, um, let, me, let me come to this before I come to this quote uh, here. Um, if you want to share a, a certain thought with someone, it is you are not expanding on the thought you are trying to communicate that particular thought for instance i want to have chocolate this is a thought that you want to share with someone you cannot explain i want to have chocolate by saying that i want to have guava 
or want to have mango. You cannot do that. You cannot add thoughts to explain thought. That thought has to be communicated, which actually means all the other thoughts that you have. I want to have mango. I want to have guava. I want to have cold drink. I want to have soda. I want to have Coca Cola. Whatever. I mean, all these things are within that totality, and you. It doesn't mean that you are adding things to actually expand or dilate the the perimeter or the premise of the totality. So everything comes to get assembled in the hair step of the Buddha, which actually means it is neither crowded, nor messy, nor pressing, nor does this hair even slightly expand. In the hair, all lands remain as usual without altering forms or displacement. Very true. I want to have, I want to have chocolate. Am I not displacing from that? That's the kind of a shared experience I want to have with you. So there is no displacement. So what is having, then this, he says that all the unutterable, the unutterable are the manners that enter the hair unutterable in the vastness of the realm. So everything becomes what? Unutterable is the deep samadhi. Unutterable is it to know all. I repeat this. I repeat this because it's, it's very important. Unutterable is the feeling of realizing the truth unutterable is the deep samadhi unutterable is it to know all so if you're not uttering anything the unutterable is not unuttering unutterable is something that you cannot utter something that you cannot describe if you cannot describe something what is the obvious consequence of that and that is contradiction which these Western thinkers, just I mentioned them in passing, were trying to talk about. So this contradiction is inherent in the way we try to understand totality of expression, totality of sharing, totality of bringing up communication bridges. This is the real essence of understanding. And what happens to this unutterable? This unutterable is it to know all. So this is where the real contradiction in the this part this particular segment of, of Mayana Buddhism comes up and this also makes it important for me to tell you that there is a lot of things that come up with this mysteries of totality because even even, even uh, this mystery is something that when you talk about the unrepresentable in Frederick James and when I when I engage with his ideas on totality, I always find that there is something the uncountable, the incalculable. There is something the invisible category that comes into your understanding of social uh, uh, prismatics or social social parallax. So that's where this this mystery is also there, and this mystery is something which I find very interesting in a sense. Now, um, what becomes important then? is that the substance, the weight, the heft of zero, not one. And that is the foundation of all numbers. That's the zero. The zero is probably the heavy number there. Now you might call it a void, but that's not a void. Because this is the this is the voidness or the emptiness that you that you talk about is about the mutual penetration and the non-obstruction of realms become possible. So when it becomes a zero, when it becomes, as you call it, the voidness, when you are talking about the void, look, it's, th th there is a strong amount of Heidegger there, but I, I will not get into, well, it gets very complication for with the very short span of the seminar, but there is Heidegger on there, which is very interestingly can be brought in, and, and I guess especially Heidegger's connections with, 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 with the Japanese philosophy, primarily the classical one. So here you see that there is a voidness that is there. And what is that voidness? That voidness creates the possibilities for mutual penetration and it creates this non obstruction realms to become possible. So, uh, if totality doesn't have contradiction, if totality doesn't have a void, then how would you get this interpenetration of ideas? How would you get this interpenetration of realms, interpenetration of uh, uh, oncoming, onrushing, interwining bodies? How is that possible? Now, this is um, this is the this is the voidness of the totality. I, I repeat, there is the cleavage in the totality, beginning from what I what I started. Uh, 
cleavage of the totality. There is this, this, this kind of contradiction in the totality. There is a split in the totality. And now I say that there is a voidness to this totality. And this voidness to this totality that I'm talking about, in a way, endows totality to produce infinite possibilities and infinite possibilities without destruction. Now, this is, um, this is a kind of an egoless state. Now, uh, I say that the, from the standpoint of Buddhism, of course, from the Sunnetta and the Hinana Buddhism, this is, the, this is the way one talks about this egoless aspect, the egoless aspect. I mean, there is no ego in the way you are trying to develop this idea of totality, which is, the, which is one of the reasons why uh, we try to get uh, 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 different kinds of uh, ideas about its totality and non-obstruction of the Buddhahood. And the different expressions that we start to get about totality and non-obstruction of the Buddhahood, I will, I will read out to you or I will explain it to you in different terms. The first thing that comes out about this uh, totality and non-obstruction of the Buddhahood is that, that the universe that the universe that you see can be infinitely vast and small depending on the scale of measurement or the position from which this measurement is made. That's the first thing that he says. And then he talks about that the larger universe inside includes the smaller ones uh, as a solar system contains its planets or a planet contains its atoms. So this system of higher realms embracing the lower ones is pictured in a structure extending ad infinitum in both directions to infinitely large or infinitely small. This is actually called in the vocabulary of the, this, this Holland vocabulary, it's the view of realms embracing realms, realms embracing realms. It's not, a, 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 very importantly, realms not clashing with realms, it's realms embracing realms. And I, I, I do go back to Hegel, to say that when he's talking about this superstition of consciousness, then he's not talking about a conflict. He, he is talking about the supersession of the conflict, the, the, the consciousness, in a way of one overcoming the other. So you know, one overcoming the other, the way through a mutual recognition or uh, uh, through the understanding of negation, this is something that is close to what it is, these ideas uh, uh, almost parallelly or correspondingly try to generate. Then he makes the other point saying that the time, the time, what kind of time do you see the totality has? That's, that's the point he's making. And he's saying that the time has lost its meaning as merely a concept for measuring the flow of even, say, in the past, present, or the future. So it, is, it has become an element of totality which actualizes the total interpenetration and containment of all events of the past, present, and future in an eternal present. Now, uh, this is how the, the Buddhahood looks at it. So which is why everything comes back to get concentrated in the hair of the Buddha. And the hair doesn't grow or the hair doesn't expand. So, this is one part of uh, the Buddhahood that we are talking about, the totality and the non-obstruction thesis. But does it in any way talk about uh, the human history? Because um, what does it do with human history? You might find this a very metaphysical in the way I'm talking about here. You might see that how, how, how do we relate that with human history? But if you go back to the Diamond Sutra, then you would see that Shukiti is looking at He's asking a question. He's saying that if there were as many Ganges rivers as there are grains of sand in the river Ganges, and if there were as many world systems as there are grains of sand in all these innumerable rivers, would these world systems be considered numerous? He's talking about the world system now. So he's talking about the worlding. I mean, I, I, I do find a lot of similarity here with the Heideggerian worlding, but how this world systems is something he's talking about, this, the production, the, 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 the estimation, the kind of speculation of a world system growing as everything comes together. Then one says, very numerous indeed, world-honored one, 
Now, with these numerous world systems, with these within this uh, numerous world system, there are to be formed, found every form of sentient being with all their various mentalities and conceptions. Now, if there are various mentalities and conceptions, there are various identities. If there are various identities, there would be the need of superstition, a Hegelian superstition. If there are, there, there, there are various mentalities and conceptions, then the inevitable the, the, the consequence would be the contradiction. So totality, if one looks at from the Buddhist perspective as well, doesn't ignore contradictions like the way we are looking at the Western tradition of thinking. So what will be the concept of history then if one looks at this Buddha world? And uh, there are, there are, you say everything is concentrated in the eternal present. There is no past and present that all comes up and in a way drops and collapses into the present. If all these things that I'm trying to talk about, which I did not I wanted to be very sure about what I'm saying. I'm just maintaining a kind of an objective distance with this thinking because it might just give you a little bit of idea here or rather an impression that it is a very, it's a very non-historical way of looking at things. I will not say that. For me, as I, as I get into finishing uh, uh, my book on trans-historicality soon, I would consider this as trans-historical. And why is it trans-historical? I will explain that to you here. How does, it, how does this Buddha who then looks at history here? Just see here. History has a beginning and history has an end. But in a relative, in a relative sense, not in an absolute sense. I repeat this, history has a beginning and history has an end, but in a relative, not in an absolute sense. That's the, that's the trans-historicality that's coming out from the Buddha hood. Or the, or, or the explanation that I've been giving to you, you all for so long. History is imbued with great significance because it is the necessary process for the realization of, per, of perfection of the Buddhahood. Now, it is a, it is a process. It is, it is not something that comes to you ready. That is, uh, if you say that the, the Buddhahood, the understanding of Buddhahood is a, a, is a redimate, uh, uh, maybe a plate full of sweets before you? No, there's a kind of a process that comes with it. And this processing of the Buddhahood, that is important. I, I, am, uh, I feel Jameson is absolutely someone who can reckon here because Jameson is also talking about an orientation here, a kind of a bringing together of a process, the way it works. But why should I go to Jameson? There are other people as well. I will try to come after Buddha to that very favorite person of mine. Uh, who I'm going to come to, to show you that he hasn't spoken about totality, but this is also a way of looking at totality. So in, in Buddhism, primarily the, the Hinayana and the Mahana Buddhism that I'm talking about here does talk about totality, but there is a one person coming after this discussion to finish with Buddha, who's really not talked specifically in totality, but his ideas are very much a part of the totality of how we understand ep epistemological discourse or cultural, political uh, um, yeah, balances of thinking. Then he says that human history has no unique significance. Human history has no unique significance. There are numerous histories of other sentient beings of equal significance in the other universe. Now, that's the non-human history. That is where the non-human history is coming. So if you think that your entire understanding of totality is very anthropocentric, human-centric, and that is what exactly what human history should be, you are wrong. Because there are equally numerous histories of other sentient beings that are working. So understanding the present, understanding your situation, understand the situatedness of your being in this world or in this planet is very much trans-historical in nature. Trans-historical doesn't mean that, uh, oh, I'm doing history, so I'm bringing sociology and, and, and anthropology into my understanding. No, that is not trans-history here. The trans-history here is primarily about how numerous are the histories within which you are situated, within which you are embedded. That's what the Buddha who talks about. And then comes the innumerable universes. Innumerable universes. Now call it the innumerable worldlings that, that, that take place. Now, art is only one tiny spot in this vast expanse of Dharma Dhatu, that is the infinite universe. And by no means is Earth the only stage upon which a unique drama is performed. No, art is not enough for human beings. There are other, other plays that there are 
are there other dramatic performances that keep happening around us which all the time contribute to the totality of the Buddhahood? That's what I'm talking about. The totality of this, uh, uh, let's call it in my terminology, aesthetic imaginary within which everything is happening. So history, whether it is human or otherwise, is not drama schemed. It is not a drama schemed and produced by God. It is brought into being by the collective karma of sentient beings. And that could be a human, that could be an ant, that could be a wasp, and that could be a bee. So everything is coming together to form the totality. So whenever you are trying to share an experience, the sheer anthropocentrism of your understanding of totality tells you that there's only a human centeredness. There is only a humanistic consolidation within which you really have to perform to explain or communicate a certain idea. But that is not what this history is talk, talks about. So there is no definite pattern or mold into which all history must fall. That is transhistorical for me. There's a definite pattern. There is no definite pattern or mold into which all histories must fall. So the mold of history is dictated by this collective karma. And this collective karma is the process. That's the orientation. That's the different kinds of world and universes, mostly unutterable, that start to get into the system to explain what this book is all about. Now, um, this is a different totality for you. Well, that, this totality wasn't there uh, uh, when one really puts up a Google search and then one would see that all oh, the theories, theorists of totality, and of course we get Hegel dropping in on dropping in, and at the same time you get Frederick Jameson and Marx. These are the people, which is why I said that I'm going to just mention them in passing, but I'm not going to talk to them about because um, uh, that would be just a very explicatory way of looking at totality. I want you people to get a little more uh, curious, a little more, uh, what should I say, generative about this seminar that I'm teaching. Now, there is, there is with Buddha, the way Buddha thinks, the way Buddha orients himself, or should I say Buddha doesn't think, because it is very important to, to, for you to know that there has been plenty of questions asked in Buddhism about does Buddha think? Does Buddha see? Can Buddha interpret? These are questions that really come if you, if you are getting into the very core of Buddhist philosophy. These are the questions that are being asked. I think um, the Buddhahood that we were talking about, that would be uh, primarily the place from where we can begin to conclude the seminar today. Um, I bring here Michel Serre, this French thinker. Um, uh, I think is 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 uh, one of the best minds. I mean, I'm actually bringing him after uh, Buddha has a sort of a politics behind that. I just want to show that this man hasn't spoken about totality, but he has so much to contribute to what I've said so far. So, which is why Michel Serre becomes important. And uh, Michel Serre is. Um, important because he brings up these figures of thought and um, uh, there is Chris Watkins talking about uh, Michelle Serre. It's, it's a beautiful book that he is talking about Michelle Serre and he, he something that explicates Michelle Serre so well but what is thinking that shared say it starts to talk about that what is thinking if not at the very least performing four operations so Serre is talking about thinking as a kind of a four operations here just see here receiving just relate that to the buddhahood relate that to the one that's talking about on totality he's not talking about totality at all he's talking about these things i'm just going to conclude the, the seminar trying to bring source uh, says idea on totality so somehow put you on this uh, uh the thinking track here it's a four operation that starts to form around this whole idea of thinking of say he calls it receiving emitting storing and processing information are these are these the four parameters within which thinking can be conducted receiving anything storing and processing information now one term that sayer is interested in and that is called the operator 
Now, operator is, or for, for say, a very interesting transdisciplinary way of looking at. And in this operator, he brings in this ideas about noise. These are things I'll come back to in my next seminars with you, because I, I would like to do a little bit of Michelle Serre with you as well. And uh, Michelle Serre Mathematics, we'll come to that later. But that will be a different seminar. But here I'm talking about that he is the operator. The operator will be a homoprodite, a kind of a parasite, a kind of a noise. And there's a, these are little philosophical characters that uh, say talks about. The second one is the, the question of inventions that say talks about. And invention would be that um, trying to introduce something different, something fresh into this great story of the universe. So it would be those um, uh, elements, just see, in, in, in Buddhahood, of course, I did not read out many sections from uh, Buddha's writings for a short of time, but just see the kind of things that Sayer is talking about. He's talking about elements, he's talking about constellations, plants, animals, nymphs, gods, idols, and their sweet twin sisters, and ideas. So he's talking about all these things that uh, uh, that cannot be reduced or cannot be in a way reductively brought into a kind of a predictable outworking, a predictable outpouring, a predictable demonstration. You cannot bring that because that is where the contradiction starts to come in. He's talking about, uh, the next part is talking about the human figures. And human figures are, uh, 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 they are, they are not always the product of the mind. The human figures are also the product of the body. So he is, he's talking about that and he, and, and he gives an example of tender carers. He gives example of the tender carers. He gives the example of tummy roll. And his distinctive ways of holding the body, the gestures, the postures and the movement. That's, that's, the, that's the, another uh, part that Say talks about. Then he is talking about uh, inventing characters, the characters that Say tries to invent, like Harbings, like Atlas, like Hero, or this Parasite or Angels, or Thumbelina or Grandpa Grummy. These are the figures that he starts to uh, develop. But these figures, are not merely descriptive figures, they are performative figures, but they are not mimetic figures, but they are participatory figures. So there is a question of the participation towards the understanding, which is why these figures become so important. And there is so much of participatory consciousness that you also find in the understanding of the Buddhahood. Now, there's another aspect that that's, uh, that say brings in is the idea of the synthetic. And when you say synthetic, this is again the Buddha. Where, but, but, I, but I told you the numerous things are interflowing into each other, coming from different directions into each other. I just, just mentioned that to you. And when you're talking about the Saren idea of the synthetic, then you see that he's drawing together in a very unique way to communicate a world. The drawing together of different things to communicate a world. That's the world that he wants to communicate exactly like the Buddha does, which is a singular, original, unique of its sort, and even marginal if you want, but in any case, unexpected, concrete character, which synthesizes a whole world and often brings it into being. That is where it comes into. So if you are trying to do that, that is bringing the whole world and trying to express that into being, I think that clearly proves that you're talking about the contradiction, the unutterable in the understanding of, or rather the unconceptualable of the totality. That's what he's interested in, the power of the totality, the latency of the totality, the connective dimension of the totality. That's what he's interested in. And uh, this is one aspect which finally gets me to talk about this whole idea of intuition, the intuition in Sayer, and uh, this is a global intuition that he talks about, because if this intuition is interesting, because when you say that there is unutterable, there is the indescribable, uh, uh, there is the imponderable, I mean, if, if, if these are the terms that you, you start to bring into your discussion, then obviously the intuition becomes a very interesting terminology here. And uh, when one talks about this intuition, then um, uh, uh, Sayer is actually drawing on the concept of uh, intuition as self-evidence in Descartes, or he's talking about the intuition that one finds in Bach, but uh, 
what am I saying, books on Henry Burke. So, and also the conversation when he, uh, in, a, in a conversation with Berlatour, he's making this saying that my goal is not above all to be right, but rather to produce a global intuition, profound and sensible. So I'm, so I'm quoting from Watkins' book, where he says that my goal is not above all to be right, but rather to produce a global intuition, profound and sensible. So what is this intuition that uh, uh, Sarah is talking about, and with which I'll conclude my understanding of totality for you all, at least for the time being. So Sayer, as I as I'm quoting Watkins here again, Sayer is not seeking to produce not a set of propositions or a system. He's not interested. What he's trying to do is trying to set up an intuition. Now, uh, the intuition here would, would, would actually be qualified as the possible ways of seeing, possible ways of experiencing and living in this world. How do you live in this world? How do you experience this world? How do you see the world? What are the possibilities that are there? That is how the intuition comes up. Exactly, I would see when one reads deeper into this idea of the Buddhahood, it's exactly there, the seeds of the possibility, the emergence of the possibility is something that you can find there as well. Uh, um, intuition then is of all things in the world, a very rare thing. But uh, most equally distributed, as Sayer says, among inventors, and they can be artists and they can be scientists. And very interestingly, he also puts it, the intuition makes the first move and strikes the first blows. So intuition is something that makes the first move and also strikes the first blow. And this is... Um, Interesting because intuition is it's, it's distinct from what you would say a very categorical understanding of things. So it would be very distinct from that. And um, uh, uh, for example, uh, it, it, as Watkins says, that we can come to an understanding of the vast duration of time since the Big Bang without intuiting it. And intuition is, in an important sense, pre rational. That's where the intuition is. But it is not anti-rational or arbitrary. The, the, the first thing that can come to your mind is that it must be very arbitrary, it must be very anti-rational. No. It could be pre-rational in an important sense, but it's not anti-rational. And this um, global intuition, you know, that way for Sayer, is made up of multiple sensations. And, and this global intuition begins with this apprehension of reality and the natural world. So for Sayer, it begins with an apprehension of reality and the natural world. Every time I'm actually not giving you the clear, categorical, methodological, clarified idea of totality. That's what I'm not allowing you to do in this seminar. I'm just trying to give you this idea to move out of this Euclidean geometric understanding of things. I'm just trying to make you see that how uh, intuition, less than being, rational, categorical, prescriptive, is more profound and sensible. That's where the intuition is. And intuition that Sarah writes again is not exclusively intellectual, but whatever the activity you are involved in, the body remains the medium of intuition, memory, knowing, working, and of all invention. Is intuition corporeal? Is intuition physical? Not a concept, but a sensibility. Intuition becomes a sensibility. Not a way of thinking, but a way of living in the world. That's where Sawyer starts to give you. Now, you see, he is very interestingly taking you, just he's just allowing you that it is not a way of thinking. That is only thinking that you can do. It is not just exactly that, but it's also a way of living in this world. And I'm, I'm, I'm clearly on, on the side of the Zamir, where living, is so important as thinking. So it is this profound and sensible in the sense that is probably the theoretical sensitivity, what Sayer calls the rhythms and sounds of existence. This is the rhythm and sound of existence that out of which out of which meaning comes out and out of which this 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 language emerges. So it is through these rhythms and sounds of existence that Sayer tries to look at 
a kind of totality, or should I call it like Buddhahood? I would call this a Syrian totality. Now, this is um, this is what Sir would call the global. And global intuition is, is, is not an isolated phenomenon or probably not a particular problem, but it's all the, all the very, every great change that happens in knowledge. This, this intuition and relationships to the world, it corresponds to a crisis over the concept of reality or of necessity. So this gets me down to the final point of this seminar where I say that intuition is not something that we experience in the world, but a way of looking at making sense of everything we experience in the world. It's what Kin says, it's a how, not a what. So you are trying to make a sense and trying to look at and make sense of everything that you experience, which is exactly why those unutterables that you talk about is not exactly about the existence of things but it is how you are trying to make sense of things how you are trying to experience those things and how you want to express them and how the expression comes out about how you understand a certain thing it is just not the what only so if the what then it more or less becomes a method and then of course it gets its own constriction fences or constrictive fences built so intuition is um it, it, it then requires what it requires cultivation requires reflection it requires meditation and uh, uh, and 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 Sayer also tells you that um, uh, there is a desire to produce rather than describe there is all the time this desire to produce something rather than describe because once you describe it is there is there is more contradiction in the production that you make rather than in the description that you produce so um uh, Sayer then obviously is 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 letting it very clearly staring at that that he is not claiming that he's not interested in truth because it might talk to you that he is a bit reckless about the things that he's saying it might it might seem to you that he's not very sure about whether there is any truth in it but 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 Sayer is very much someone who believes in a kind of a truth and uh, this what kind of truth that he's talking about is that he's not actually trying to have a kind of a particular global intuition of the world, one particular global intuition of the world, and, and maybe just asking you to really stay immune and imprisoned within a particular game, a particular set, a particular schema that you want to be in. But, you know, it's like, to be, of course, uh, global intuition is the sense that you make of it. and. If you follow it up from the Buddhahood, Buddhahood is also about the sense that you start to make about the sharing, the understanding, the orientation, the, the, the embracing, the, the, the non-obstruction non of things that the Buddhahood talk about, say it talks about, but it talks about with uh, not without a, a kind of a disrespect for the idea of truth. So intention, sorry, intuition for say would be a kind of invention it is of great use and you can make new things out of intuition here so um let us put it finally what say is trying to do here and it's the final part and then i would conclude my uh, lecture today and my seminar today so intuition if you talk about this global intuition, it clearly shows that we are not particularly playing within a particular regime. We are not really uh, involved in a kind of a certain regime of historicity or certain regime of understanding that we are not interested in. What we are interested primarily is that intuition is responsible for great inventions. That's our say or put say. Well, that could be uh, Bergson's intuition, uh, well, about time duration, or even Galileo's uh, uh, invention where the universe is actually written in a language of mathematics. So that's one. Then the intuition is not irrational. It's an stream of rationality. That's also very important. And intuition also helps one that initiates. Intuition initiates thinking. Intuition initiates an understanding. Intuition initiates a sensible and profound way of trying to embrace this world. And there comes the question of uh, uh, abstraction that follows after that, not that abstraction should come first and then we start to follow that abstraction. So 
it is about finally where the proof starts to catch us up as best as we can. And this proof that we try to find about things really builds a kind of an intuition as where we try to intuit certain things in a way of moving forward or understanding forward. So the question that uh, I, I ask you here finally is whether totality is this Syrian global intuition, whether this intuition is something that really can explain the whole idea of totality differently from these people that I have mentioned, primarily the first four thinkers that I've mentioned. How would Sayer, Sayer's totality be an intuition when it becomes pre-rational, it becomes inventive, it has become corporeal, it becomes reflective, it emits, it orients, it processualizes, and yet it is not far from truth. Thank you so much. I would like to conclude here. Thank you. Thank you, Ranjinda, for this wonderful lecture. Yeah. Um, now, if you.